All right, so coming up now we have Chris and Skip, and their talk is Still Passing the Hash 15 Years Later. Thanks, guys. All right, first, who do we have in here? Do we have any executives? Raise your hand. One, two. Do we have any managers? Just a couple managers. Uh, admins, network system admins. All right, pen testers, security people. All right. So that's going to tailor how we, how we do this. We're going to move through the basics of uh, passing the hash really quickly because uh, the vast majority of you were uh, pen testers or security people. All right, next slide. So like you said, please fill out the surveys. I'm Chris. He's Skip. Skip is a Linux guy. He uh, has some experience talking. I do not. Uh, I used to be an army officer, so um, yeah, next slide. The, uh, all the codes available should be available today on uh, the Google page. But we'll be blogging over the next few weeks uh, how to use the tools, uh, specifically what we demo. The vast majority of this talk is going to be demos. We got about 25 minutes of demos. So we're going to fly through these slides. Follow us on Twitter. Next slide. Uh, this attack's been around for 15 years since 1997. The end result of the attack was a tool a lot of pen testers know pretty well, the patched. Uh, Samba client by the FUFUS group. We've used it a lot. Next slide. Uh, to gain access to data because that's what matters. We want to gain access to file servers. We want to gain access to, to emails. We want to gain access to applications using this attack. Next slide. So a regular day in, in a Windows enterprise, you log in, you log into your email, you go to SharePoint, you just do work and you log in one time. Uh, same pretty much for sysad, they log in hopefully with a uh, less privileged account and then eventually log in with a more privileged account but only once. So this single sign on process for that Microsoft has designed works. It works really well for what it's intended to do. You only have to log in once. Next slide. So there's basically two ways that passwords are hashed locally, uh, NT and LM uh, and that's different than NTLM which goes over the wire. Next slide. Uh, everyone knows the difference. I'm assuming if you're mostly security and pen test people, difference between LM and, and NT. <clears throat> All right, so a token is created when a user logs in. Next slide. It has four uh, impersonation levels or four different security levels. Uh, incognito is a tool we all use to move between those levels to actually impersonate other tokens. Next slide. All right, Kerberos is the default for modern Windows domains. A lot of people aren't, don't realize that and it's been that way for several years. Uh, Kerberos uses tickets and is a complete change. We're not really talking about that. If you'd like some background on Kerberos, read the white paper that's on the DVD. Uh, there's also a lot of background on NTLM and NT. So if you're unfamiliar with this stuff, if you are one of the managers, please go ahead and pull out your laptop and check that out. Next slide. All right, so smart cards actually don't change the way that Windows authentication works. Uh, on the back end, NT is, NTLM is still used, uh, but it was bolted on the top of Kerberos. Uh, other organizations buy third party apps to implement things like key fobs and RSA tokens, but again, it doesn't change on the back end how Windows is actually authenticating. Next slide. All right, so Kerberos versus NTLM. Uh, the big thing is even if you have Kerberos uh, enforced and set up, if you use an IP address to address something, Kerberos is based on DNS. If you use an IP address, you can force the use of NTLM unless it's been completely disabled. So <coughs> we've got SharePoint and custom apps that are now using NTLM. So you've pushed NTLM outside of just internal enterprise applications. So you've got the latest version of OWA and, and a lot of SharePoint instances that are sitting on the internet are using NTLM authentication. You also have Exchange and OWA that are using it and uh, other things like appliances and uh, printer scanner copiers can have NTLM baked into it for authentication. All right, so has anyone in here actually eliminated NTLM from their enterprise? That's what I thought. It's almost impossible, even in a lab, to do. 
You can disable it as much as you want, but you, you run into major issues doing very simple tasks. Like how would you actually add a machine to the domain using Kerberos when Kerberos has to occur from a machine that's on the domain? You can't. So they have to fall back to something. Uh, and again, that's discussed in the white paper. So it's going to break a lot of stuff if you try to completely rid your enterprise of NTLM. Next slide. So that gets to passing the hash. So the hash itself is used in authentication. Even in the Kerberos process, the hash, the NT hash is a part of that process. So the hash is still there and it's probably going to be there for a very long time. Next slide. All right. So this is important from this point on. Since you guys are mostly pen testers, you understand this concept. We already have the hashes. So however you gotten to this point, for the demos and from this point on, we're assuming not just local hashes, you've knocked over the DC. There are a million ways to get to that point but once, you, once you've done it, the point of this is to move forward and get to the value, get to the business data and show the CEO, show who's paying for you to be there that this attack and their data can be compromised once you've knocked over the domain controller. Skip and I have done a lot of work on cracking passwords. Uh, it's kind of a point of competition between us. We like to shoot for uh, if it's all NT, we don't really count it. If your enterprise is still, still has LM, we don't even care. We'll just use rainbow tables. But if you're all NT and you've got a, a really good password policy, we shoot to still try to crack over 50% of your hashes. So it's still possible to crack them but we don't have to and we're going to show you all the ways that you can do things without actually cracking those, uh, those hashes. Next slide. All right, so this is what a typical pass the hash attack kind of looks like. Uh, most people use Metasploit. If you search SMB and Metasploit, you'll see the stuff that you can supply a hash to. Uh, you can do the SMB login scans to see if the hashes work. And then you can use the PS exec module, which is pretty common uh, for pen testers. So the PS exec module works great. You, you hit, uh, it works great on a box that doesn't have AV and that the hashes are valid for. It's actually going to upload an executable that, it, that it's going to create when you run the module and then it's going to start that executable as a service. Uh, AV has got hip to that. So there are different ways to make this more successful but in the end all you have is a shell. Next slide. So when you're trying to brief this to whoever is paying for you to actually be there, uh, they don't really understand shells. No matter how you show them that you've got NT authority system on a domain controller, you know, that's game over for most of the people in the room, but it doesn't really matter to them. So unless you show them some sort of effect, they really, they really don't care from what we've seen. So what you have to go after is the data, whatever is the heart of the business. Focus on that. So you've gotten the, the system shell on the domain controller. How do you move forward? How do you go after the actual data? So you could start by going after file shares, but we've been able to do that for a long time using the patched Samba client. But everyone knows on file shares you find passwords, you find interesting things, but real business data normally doesn't reside uh, on file shares. You have marketing data, y you may have some research stuff, but data actually resides. Next slide. In, uh, in databases, in email, and we'll take a look at that in, in a second. But Windows it itself actually passes the hash regularly just to operate. So it's constantly doing that, so why can't we? Next slide. All right, so this is kind of confusing. Our, the, our demo is actually inside of an enclave more so than inside the domain. It's, it's actually not on the domain itself, th this first one. We're sitting inside the firewall. Uh, we've already dumped the hashes, we've already owned them and we care about three people. Three people have access to the, to the data that we're trying to go after. Alice, Bob and the uh, CEO. So our, our box is a Windows 7 box. We're going to start by doing a demo of a Windows environment, how to do all this stuff with Windows uh, and then we'll, we'll move and skip, we'll show you some new tools to use to do all this stuff in Linux. We're going to use WCE. Uh, is anybody familiar with WCE? Uh, Hernan Ochoa's tool is awesome. 
it will basically allow you to accomplish anything that you would want to do but the problem is it only runs on Windows. So I'll show you how to do it all on a, on a Windows box and then Skip will show you how to do it from Backtrack. Next slide. So we'll start by uh, using the TAC S which will actually set the credential um, and basically we'll go over, go ahead and talk through what the demo is and then I'll talk through it again as we go and then use TAC C to run a command. And, and the important, the interesting thing is we're going to do this from a box that's not on the domain. So if you're an internal pen tester and you just sit on the network, you should be able to do all of this from just a Windows machine. Next slide. So we can actually kill explorer.exe on our box. So we showed up, we're pen testers, we've plugged in. We can sit down and use our box, kill the admin session, because hopefully we're local admins on our own pen test box. We can kill that kill Explorer and actually start Explorer as a user on their domain if we can uh, actually authenticate against the DC with the hashes. We can launch Internet Explorer and browse the SharePoint sites logged in. Next slide. And we can fire up Outlook, set up a new profile and read people's emails with their hashes. And we can access uh, file shares with net commands. Uh, Skip wanted to point out that the save cred doesn't work. Maybe someone in this room knows why. Uh, we think, we suspect that save cred and when you do uh, net use is actually sticking the plain text password somewhere and calling it later because it does not allow you to use it when you supply a hash. All right, so we can actually fire up uh, SQL commands, T SQL, O SQL. And, uh, and interact with SQL databases and in the demo we actually pull out and use the full SQL management studio. Next slide. And we can basically do anything that an admin does. So whatever an administrator typically uses, PS exec, WMI, uh, interesting PowerShell, you can fire up a PowerShell instance and any commandlet that doesn't require you to re-authenticate can be used. Uh, ADUC and computer management which I'll show you in the demo. All right, so let's go ahead and knock out this demo. So this demo is about 10 minutes long and it moves uh, pretty quickly. So we'll start by using WCE and you'll see the hashes we've already dumped. It's a pretty simplistic demo. We've got the 500 account. We've got uh, MS SQL account, Alice, Bob and the CEO which we've already talked about. The domain name is demo. So we fired up a new command prompt. So now we're just, uh, we're going to use PS exec to PS exec into the domain controller. So now we have a, we, we have an admin shell on the domain controller itself. So now anything we're doing, we're doing on the actual DC. So we've used the hashes and we can do anything that we want. All right, so we kill the PS exec. We're going to go ahead and open up ADUC and we get this strange error. But all we have to do, we have DNS set up, so all we have to do is pop in the domain and then ADUC is running with the administrator hashes so it authenticates passing the hash on the back end. And we, it appears we have full access to Active Directory. But let's go ahead and add a user and, uh, and see if that's the case. Uh, and the reason that we left this in the demo is to show you that not everything works as intended. So if you're a pen tester, you probably already know this, sometimes things don't just work. So we're going to go ahead and set the password and find out that we actually can't do this. So we don't know what the error is, we don't know why, someone in here might know, uh, but using the GUI, we can't add a user. But that's okay because we don't typically use the GUI. Uh, Joeware Tools has AD mod. Uh, you can use net commands as well. But in this case, we're going to go ahead and use AD mod with our command prompt that is running with the set credentials of the administrator. And we will DOS them with new users. So our demo domain now has 10 new users. We can go back to, to ADOC and there they are. So we can create users and set the password but we just can't do it through Active Directory users and computers. We can add our new users to the domain admins group. 
without issue. Uh, and then if we go and try to set the password for one of them, let's see what happens. Okay, next we'll go ahead and uh, create a computer account. So we can pre-stage a computer account and through ADUC and it does not give us an error. We can actually reset it so that it's staged in whatever OU. So if you wanted to hide somewhere, you can do that. None of this stuff is new. If you've never done this on a pen test, uh, that's cool. It's pretty, pretty simple. WCE makes this entire process uh, very easy. But as you can see, we can't change, we still can't change the password for whatever reason. All right, so let's open up computer management. Let's look at some other admin tasks that you would typically do. Let's connect to another computer. We'll connect to a server. We can start and stop services. Let's find one that won't crash the box. So remote registry restart it, we could stop it. So again, none of this stuff is uh, particularly exciting. Maybe you don't go after data but typically most data that we find that enterprises are trying to protect reside in databases. So we're going to use the MS SQL service account hash here and we're going to open up a, another command prompt uh, as that hash. Uh, if you're doing this on your own, uh, quick gotcha, you might want to, you might have to set permissions to allow like limited users to access your own box. <coughs> and we can fire up, we start Explorer, we can fire up uh, MS SQL login failed because we're just logged in as, in this case, skip. So now let's see what happens when we actually, uh, fire up the tool through our elevated session using the hash. Of course it works. Um, it does not know who is actually logged in. It thinks that Skip is still logged in as you can see there. But who is actually logged in is that MS SQL service account. So we have got full access to the entire back end database as the hopefully elevated MS SQL demo slash backslash MS SQL account. All through passing the hash with WCE. So WCE is an awesome tool that will help you move beyond just shell to actually getting data. So you can get at data with admin hashes. Now let's go after user data. Because in some environments that have appropriately restricted privilege, some users actually have more access than administrators do to sensitive data. So it, may, it might be several small, se several small groups that are able to access important applications. And one example we'll show you right here. Uh, Who am I does not work with WCE. It will think you are the interactive session that you started. So it still thinks we're skip. And let's fire up uh, Outlook first as the user and see if Outlook can figure out. In this case, we've started Outlook with our normal account, so we have to create a new profile, which is new in the newer versions of Office. So, just like a normal user, without ever having to put our password in, we can connect to the Exchange server using the hash and WCE and access all of their uh, emails. And this is pretty logical. Uh, I think everyone in the room knew that you could do this. Uh, the important thing is to show managers, to show admins the actual effect of, uh, of a compromise of the, the hashes, the NT hashes themselves. <coughs> All right, so whatever. A Alice's calendar, she's got, or this is Bob's calendar, or the CEO's calendar. Dinner with Alice. That's interesting. 
all right, so let's open IE. Let's check out SharePoint. Let's uh, this is Alice. Okay. So we're going to SharePoint with our IE instance fired up through the pass the hash, and we're automatically logged in as Alice. The NTLM SSP allows us to very easily gain access to users' data, users' data if we have the hashes themselves. <clears throat> All right, Alice does not have access, so we'll have to try someone else's account to gain access to that data. All right, we can use net commands, we can mount shares, we can write to shares that they have access to. Uh, permissions work the same as they would with a normal account. Uh, Alice does not have access to the CEO's share. So she can't write little messages to him or her. But she can write to her own, which is all logical and probably things you've demonstrated in the past. <coughs> so we'll, we'll set our credentials to Bob using Bob's hash. And we'll go ahead and kill Explorer. Just show you a little neat trick. So Explorer dies. We're we have this command.exe running as Bob, so we can just start Explorer again. And now we're logged in as Bob, so we can just use IE and browse. And there we are, logged in as Bob. So silly uh, pen test tricks with passing the hash and WCE. Overall, nothing uh, extremely exciting. Again, shared folders, the, the net commands work. Bob has access to Bob's folder, does not have access to the CEO or Alice's. He can write to his own directory. All right, so we'll change, we'll set the credential one more time as the CEO and see what access the CEO has. All right, so now we have another instance of cmd.exe running as the CEO in the demo domain. So let's go to SharePoint again and see what the CEO has going on. Because when you show the CEO his calendar or his email, he's going to get excited, maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way. All right, so there's uh, a command line test with open change that you'll see in the next demo. Uh, there's the CEO's calendar all set up through SharePoint, and this is something we commonly see. Email, calendar, uh, files, everything in SharePoint. Uh, I guess he's looking for a new employee at Black Hat. Uh, and he's got dinner with multiple women. That probably should not show up in the report. So we, you can basically have the, the sessions of multiple users open, uh, but just one at a time with Explorer. And that concludes uh, the Windows demo. So the next part will be uh, Skip explaining some of the gotchas, and then, uh, and then he's going to show you ways to do all of that in Linux and maybe have an exciting announcement after that. All right. 
Hello. All right. A little taller than he is. Anyway, so uh, when we were putting these demos together, we're trying to use uh, software that's representative of what we've seen on assessments. So at first I tried to use, when my first demo environment, I tried using Outlook 2007, worked perfectly. I created the restricted demo just with only the services I want and for whatever reason it didn't work. So I uh, reverted back to Outlook 2003 and it worked fine. Uh, who knows? Um, one thing I think that's been demonstrated is that when you start doing this stuff on a Windows environment, it gets a little freaky. Uh, it doesn't like doing some of these things. Um, probably because it's not the way it's used to dealing with it. So, for example, ADUC couldn't assign passwords. Create accounts, you could create computer accounts, you could change uh, group membership, you could disable accounts, enable accounts, you could do almost anything except for set a password. Next slide. Uh, also, multiple GUI apps, uh, or you can't start uh, like IE under two separate users uh, at the same time. Uh, I think what it does is the first uh, one that's open, it just creates a new thread under that current process, even if you start it as somebody else's token. Kind of weird, but it's the way it is. So, anyway, obviously if you do this kind of thing, uh, expect some oddities when dealing with Windows environment. But, you know what, I'm a Linux guy. That's kind of cool, but let's do all that with Linux. So previously mentioned was the uh, JMK at Fufus uh, patched the uh, Asamba, which is a suite of uh, RPC libraries and some rudimentary command line stuff that integrates or allows Linux to interact with a Windows environment. Uh, his patch basically worked by setting an environmental variable with the SMB hash and then you put the hash in that environmental variable and you run all, this, all the Samba commands and assuming that the environmental variable was set properly, uh, it would substitute the hash. Next slide. That's kind of cool, but we want to do it all from the command line in case we want to script events or uh, be able to easily use uh, like GUI apps and stuff like that. So we added a capability where uh, if the password is, that's provided to the command line is 65 characters, it looks and sees that it's an LM hash, a colon, and then the NT hash, or a 68 character, LM colon NT colon colon colon, which looks an awful lot like FG dump output or hash dump output or something like that. So if the password is one of those two, substitute the hash instead so we avoid the environmental variable issue. Next slide. Easier to use in scripts because all you have to do is just copy and paste the, uh, the hash, change the username, and once again it allows GUI access like Firefox to be able to change the uh, hashes without having to kill Firefox and restart Firefox after changing the environmental variable. So it's pretty easy to patch a lot of utilities. Uh, you find something that supports NTLM authentication. You find where the, uh, where the source code does the MD4, which really about the only thing anyone uses MD4 for these days is NTLM authentication. Check to see if the password is 65 or 68 characters and then you substitute in by converting the 32 bit or 32 byte uh, hash value that's basically hex nibbles into a 16 byte integer array. So a lot of people think that Samba is just for accessing file shares. Uh, there's actually a lot of really cool things you can do with Samba and there's a lot of cool things that link to Samba because it's built on top of it. So really what Samba is at its core is a library that can be linked to for DCE RPC interaction with uh, Microsoft environments. Uh, we're also going to be releasing, uh, I called it the Pass the Hash Rosetta Stone. It's going to be a Google Docs spreadsheet uh, that talks about how to do various common Windows net commands under Samba using the corresponding Samba commands. Uh, that's something that 
we always try to figure out how to do stuff in uh, multiple ways. So utilities that link with Samba. We've got uh, PS Exec uh, clone in WinEXE. It's been out there for a while. Uh, the latest version offers 32 and 64-bit service support so you can use in pretty much any Windows environment. Uh, I found a basic WMI uh, query utility and in the uh, source code there was a demo program that was never really compiled or finished that allows for blind command execution doing WMI with a little bit of tweaking. Uh, and then OpenChange, which is a uh, open source implementation of the Exchange RPC libraries and essentially allows people to access Exchange from Linux. Uh, Firefox, uh, by default, if you try, if it's prompted for NTLM authentication, it uh, tries to use built-in Samba. It assumes that the Linux box itself is on the domain, so it tries to query through WinBind. But if you go dig in about colon config, there's an NTLM that uses its own baked-in method. So we just patch the baked-in method, use that, and away we go. Uh, you can go to about config, search for NTLM, NTLM, and then search for network auth, force generic NTLM, set it to true. We'll show that in the demo. Uh, Free TDS is a library that uh, allows access to Sybase and MS SQL databases. Uh, once again, it supports NTLM authentication. So, uh, based on Davenport, which is one of the two well documented NTLM reverse engineerings that's out there, Samba did one and then Davenport did another. The Davenport website, if you haven't read their NTLM write up, it's extensive. And then they provide a sample implementation in Java which a lot of people just basically copy and paste, rename the stuff and make it work in C. So we know how to patch it. Uh, you combine uh, FreeTDS with uh, Squish because FreeTDS is really just a library. Squish is a, an actual interactive uh, utility and you get access to uh, SQL databases from Linux. So let's go ahead and get the demo going. We use the exact same demo environment, only our client this time is uh, Linux. So here, uh, dump the hashes. We're just going to do a quick uh, login with, w, uh, to with WinEXE. So we'll log into the DC, which is 172.16.1.1 as administrator. And the command line, this is one of several ways you can pass the password on the command line, domain slash administrator percent sign and then the password hash and as you can see we just logged into the DC uh, as administrator. Um, in the next WinEXE we'll do the same thing. Uh, the DC is a 32-bit 2008. The uh, exchange server is a 64-bit so we'll change, log into that one and in this case we logged in as system. So you have the uh, ability to select the high privilege account as opposed to the UAC account as well. And apparently I'm talking faster than the, slide, than the demo. All right, so we use uh, FreeTDS. FreeTDS requires that you set up a configuration file rather than pass stuff on the command line. I might look at uh, fixing that later. So I set it up to point at our uh, exchange server which is where the Microsoft SQL database is. Uh, its profile name is MS SQL in the config file. There's the uh, command. That's where we copy and paste the hash. And just to show that I'm not faking the funk here, I actually changed the last character from an A to a B. Try to log in and it doesn't work. Change it back to an A and now I'm into the database running commands against Microsoft SQL from Linux using the hash. Poke around a little bit. 
Uh, we loaded the uh, AdventureWorks database uh, onto the SQL server so that we could play around with some dummy data, which is actually a lot harder than you think to try to gen up a demo environment. So in this case, what I'm doing is I am heading to the AdventureWorks database. Uh, database. I find that one of the tables has credit card information in it. And then we'll uh, access the credit card information. Pretty good for a demo when you're talking to a C level. Okay, by the way, using password hashes, we were able to get all your customer data, all the credit card info for all your customers. We'll be going over uh, on our blog how to do all this stuff. We'll do blog entries for each one of the utilities, sample uses, uh, caveats we've run into, uh, that sort of thing. So a lot of this stuff is not extremely well documented. We're going to try to make it more practically documented. So anyway, there's a fat finger and all just to demonstrate that <laughs> even I make mistakes. And so here I pull out all of the uh, dummy credit card data where the card type is equal to Vista. All right. Firefox. This is actually one of my favorites. So I created, I started Firefox in the profile mode. I set that as a default so that we can create a separate profile for using pass the hash. You go to about colon config, click by the nasty warning. You just type NTLM up there. And then the uh, network auth force gener uh, generic NTLM, we set it to true. So keep in mind when accessing Microsoft SharePoint, Oh, uh, that sort of thing that Firefox might not render it properly or you won't get the full functionality, but it still works well enough. So we're going to log in as Alice. And once again, I hit the, uh, I installed an add on to show that the hash that I copied and pasted in there was what was there. And boom, there we go. Thank you. I'm also going to release a version of Firefox for Windows. Uh, same source, same patch, same everything, just built on the Windows stuff, uh, which may or may not be useful for you. So we do the same thing. We log out, log in with Bob. Once again, show the password, just uh, show that I'm not faking the funk there. Hit reload a couple times for the, the page to refresh. And this got cut out of the Windows demo, but Bob actually has access to run queries against the AdventureWorks database, whereas Alice did not. Then I believe we sign into OA with the CEO's password and password hash. This is one of those things that uh, was a little weird under Firefox. The CEO tab under Windows populated properly. Unfortunately, on uh, Linux it didn't, so I just go straight to the OA instead and uh, pull up his email and poker his calendar and whatnot. Note that stuff like tasks, uh, the calendar shows up, mail shows up, but several other things do not show up by default under Linux, like the tasks, the to-do list, that sort of thing. So yes, he's looking for Bob's replacement, which is probably something Bob would like to know about. And uh, yeah, he's still having dinner with Alice and the wife. That could be a little awkward. They're on different nights at least. 
So OpenChange, uh, when you use OpenChange, you have to set up a profile for every user ahead of time. So I'm going to go ahead and create a profile for each one of the three users, which is what's going on here. Um, OpenChange allows you to access the, uh, the exchange mailboxes. You can send mail from the command line. I'll demonstrate that here in a minute after all this uh, typing. And uh, you can also dump mailboxes to mbox format. Uh, you can access the calendar, but when I tried doing the uh, open change to iCal, it just kept segfaulting on me. So obviously it's a little flaky. But if you can get to it through OA, you know, you still have access to the data. So this Getting it set up, unfortunately, is a bit tedious, but you could probably script it, and if you wanted to, for pure shock value, you could probably script up accessing every account on the exchange server, dumping the mailbox, then handing the client a DVD with everyone's mail in plain text format from their exchange server. That might raise a few eyebrows. This is all about accessing the company's data. People think that because normal pass the hash just dumps you in a shell that you can't read the email. You can't get to this data that's in the SQL database. But they all use NTLM authentication. NTLM has been fundamentally broken for years. And uh, it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm smart enough to come up with this stuff on my own. I'm sure someone's probably done it before. The fact that no one's talked about it probably means those are the types of people that keep really quiet on your network. So draw your own conclusions from there. So anyway, here I use Alice's profile to send a, an email from the command line to uh, the CEO. And then I believe I use, uh, do the same thing with uh, one of the other, uh, with the CEO and I send it to Bob. You can also uh, modify inboxes directly and then sync up changes. So you could use a regular mail program to access the inbox after you download it, delete messages, change messages, do whatever, and then resync it with Exchange, and all the messages will change on the back end. I don't demonstrate that here because I was concerned with time. <laughs> so anyway, you use uh, Exchange to uh, inbox to dump it, dump the uh, the profiles mailboxes into inbox format. In this case, I'm dumping it into a mail directory. And then after I dump all of them, I will use my favorite mail reader, Pine, to go in and read everyone's email from Unix. And the last little bit of the demo, I uh, run a sample WMI query against a database. If you're not familiar with WMI, you can do some really interesting things with it. Uh, I just copied and pasted the command line there, gave it a couple seconds. So in this case, what it's doing is it's selecting name and process ID from win32 underscore process, which basically gives you a remote process listing of what's running on that particular machine. The next command is a blind command inject, uh, execution. So I run command.exe, waxe, dir, c colon slash, and I save the file because it's a blind execution to a text file. Run it, you don't get any sort of real feedback. But then I use SMB get, which is kind of a w get thing that uh, Samba has to go access that file. And we have the directory entry. So it's not, it's asynchronous, but you could actually do some interactive stuff with it. So. Thank you. All right, so Chris talked about it a little bit. How do you uh, eliminate, how, how do you defend against this? 
you can uh, try to eliminate the use of NTLM. Uh, as Chris mentioned, it's a real pain. Uh, in all likelihood, it will break things. It will break things you don't think about, like NASs, appliances, printers, copiers, digital senders, things that cannot be a member of the domain. Of course, you could always try not losing the DC in the first place. I know it's kind of crazy. Um, Kerberos uses the NT hash for encrypting the tickets between the KDC and principals. So Kerberos is no safer from losing the hashes than anything else. The problem is no one really has any practical attacks for it. We uh, talk about in the white paper a, uh, a theoretical attack. We may look at implementing it at some point. Uh, where basically you can completely undermine the trust of Kerberos if you have access to all the hashes. So, keep. anyway, uh, Windows plus WCE plus hashes is access to all your data. Uh, may work a little weirdly, but it does work. Uh, Linux plus pass the hash plus tools plus hashes equals access to all your data. So, uh, giving some shouts out here to folks. Uh, thanks to JMK at Fufus for the 68 character suggestion. And I'd also like to give a special thanks to Pure Hate, who is working valiantly on getting this stuff directly integrated into Backtrack. So the website will, I will have Debian packages available. The DVD has all the Debian packages. I will post some instructions shortly on getting them installed and configured and start walking through the tools on the blog. But, uh, Pretty soon that's going to be obsolete as soon as we get a couple minor issues worked out on the backtrack package. So it'll be available as a direct backtrack repository. All right. Uh, uh, yep. So anybody have any questions or anything? Uh, Chris and I will be hanging out for a bit. So uh, do we have a mic or anything? Or I guess there's a mic stand back there. If you want to. Right behind the cameraman. You talked about attacking the DC, but um, can I use the hashes which are cached on my local machine? Um, yes, actually, using WC. Well, it it depends. Uh, in a domain environment, on most modern versions of Windows, uh, you can't use the local SAM 500 account. Uh, unless there's a registry setting that's been fixed. We'll talk about that in a blog entry. That's something that we cut from the presentation for time. But if you have domain creds that are cached that you can access or you gain access to from like WCE, those will work just fine. Using WCE in Windows, in Windows uh, have you tried to, to spawn multiple uh, WCE sessions in multiple desktops? Uh, no, did not try doing that explicitly. I think there can only be one explore process running at a time. Um, I don't know, I haven't tried experimenting with trying to spawn multiple desktops as multiple users. That would be a very interesting thing to try. Yeah, I was just reading uh, some sysinternal stuff and I don't remember if explorer is spawned on the desktop level or the session level. Yeah, I know the sysinternal tool. I've played with it briefly, but I haven't considered, I haven't tried doing it with that. That might be something to play with. Did you ma modify the Firefox source code or did you add an add-on? I modified the Firefox source code. All of the Firefox add-ons don't directly, none of the Firefox add-ons actually add any sort of authentication methods to the code itself. And, and that goes about for all the uh, MAPI client and open change and everything as well? You modified Yes, I modified the source code. So the, the Google code page will have all the patches. I'm not going to host the, you know, their source packages and whatnot, but, and I'll also post the build scripts that I use, and it's basically the same stuff that Pure Hate's using to build the backtrack packages. Thanks. Uh-huh. Do these attacks work in organizations who are forcing NTLM version 2? Yes. Okay. Uh, NTLM v2 is, still de uh, depends on the hashes. Obviously the tool itself has to support it. It took the Davenport guys 10 years to reverse engineer NTLM v2. Uh, Sama guys, I think, to get a working implementation, it took maybe five years. But now that everybody has that, yes, it works perfectly against NTLM v2. In fact, all the stuff I did in the demos, I enforced NTLM v2. Awesome. 
Thank you. Hmm? Oh, yeah, one other little thing. Uh, the CEO this whole time was forced to use a smart card to log in. Smart card logins are only for the console. Network access doesn't apply. Anybody else? Any other questions? Otherwise Chris is going to start dancing. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the talk. <laughs> <laughs>